Now, has everyone heard of OkCupid? Does everyone know what that is? OkCupid, it's a, it's a dating site. So I'm sure you all are very familiar with that, right? Well, a few years ago, OkCupid did an experiment. They decided that for one day, they were going to take down all of the pictures. The whole idea was it was going to be like a blind date type of thing. And so people couldn't see other profile pictures. And guess what happened? Traffic dropped 80% on the website that day. So nobody wanted to get uh, matched up with someone if they couldn't see a picture of what they look like. But here's what they found. The people who actually used the site on that day found out that they, they, they did some further study and, and research into the people who actually went to the site that day. The people who struck around, stuck around, they found had better satisfaction with their interactions than they typically do. Um, the, the, the people who just talked with people and interacted with people based on similar likes or dislikes, based on similar um, things like that, ended up having a better experience than, than they normally would when they saw the, the people's picture. When people went and they weren't distracted by something like attractiveness. It turned out that they had a better opportunity of finding someone that they were compatible with. <coughs> now the reason I share that is, I think many times in our human experience, we don't want what's best for us. I think, just like those people on that website, they wanted to base who they spoke to on what someone looks like. But we, we know, for those of us who have been around for a while, that looks are not the most important thing. Thank God. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we know that a relationship that's based on looks is not going to last. We know that to build a solid, enduring relationship, it has to be based on things so much deeper than what someone looks like. And so often in life, we want things that are not good for us. We want things that are not good for our relationship with God. We want things like comfort. We want our lives to be happy and joyful. We want our, our situation, we want to be financially stable. We want to live in a world where there's no, um, there's no pandemics, there's no sickness, there's no cancer. We want to live in this place that's perfect. But God does not give that to us. God does not give us a world that is perfect and whole. Instead, we live in a broken place. God does not give us peace and comfort. He gives us trial and struggle and suffering. We're going to see today that God wants us to have a very different perspective on trial than what we have right now. We're going to see today as we begin a new series on the book of James. We're going to be, as we look at this book, James is a book that really, I think, is a very practical book that describes what authentic faith looks like. I think we live in a time where you know, in certain situations, maybe previously in, in the history of our nation, but, you know, and I've lived in certain situations where, where it's very popular to, to go to church. You know, I grew up uh, part of my life in New York, but then we moved to Indiana, which is right in the middle of the Bible Belt. 
and everybody goes to church. Does that mean everyone is a Christian? No. And James is writing this book to show the early church what authentic faith looks like. Now, I hope that as we go through this book that we're challenged on, on how we live and what we do. I think this book is, is a challenge to us. I, I don't think we should look at it and say, oh, I struggle in this area, therefore I don't have authentic faith. No, I think what it should in fact, instead do is encourage us to grow and become more like Christ in the areas where we lack. And the first thing that James speaks about in this book is how believers, Christians, should have joy in trials. Let's look at James chapter 1, verse 1. We see the introduction to the book in this verse. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Now, we see in this introduction just a few important things. First of all, James is the author of this book. And the vast majority of scholars believe that James, that this, who wrote this book, is James, the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus, became an influential leader in the early church. And it is believed that he is the one who wrote this book. Which gives us a, a little bit of perspective when we, when we go through it and understand who, who these words are coming from. Also, you'll notice it's written to the 12 tribes. Now, James was raised in a Jewish home, Jewish situation. This book is written primarily to the early Jewish Christians. Now, we have a lot of books in the New Testament that are focused on Gentile Christians. Now, there, and there are a few that focus primarily on the, Jew, the early Jewish Christians. And this is, this is the perspective of James. He is writing to early Jewish Christians that were spread throughout the Roman Empire. And so we see that sometimes that Jewish perspective is a little different than the Gentile perspective. Because the truth is, they come from two, two very different worldviews. And they had very different struggles. They, they had very different outlooks on the world. And so James, I think, is confronting a Jewish Christian community that sometimes struggle with letting go of the Jewish thoughts that could, that could cause them to struggle with the new Christian faith that they had embraced. <coughs> We're going to see that some of the, the struggles with the old covenant still linger. We're going to see that right away. Because sometimes in that old covenant way of thinking, there was this idea that blessings and obedience were tied hand in hand. That if you obeyed God, you would be blessed. And that blessing included physical blessings. So James is right away going to deal with the struggle that they dealt with. What about when life is not easy? What about those times when it does not seem as if God is blessing us? Because I am suffering, I am going through a trial, I am experiencing difficulty. What is God doing at those times in our lives? Now, even though this is written to a Jewish audience, there is so much here for us. There is so much here for us to understand and apply to our lives. And especially a year like 2020, where I don't care who you are, you've gone through some trial. You've gone through trials, and especially here uh, in this community, where we've gone through multiple trials, and we've experienced some crazy things. This is a, is a book for us, and especially this morning, this is a passage for us. When we understand how authentic faith handles trials. So let's look at verse 2. And this verse is, is really going to be the main thought of, of our whole passage. Verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. 
Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Now let's be honest. How often are you joyful when you go through a trial? Raise your hand, come on. No? Nobody? Um, this is not the normal human response to trials. What is our typical response to trials in our lives? Oh, come on. Frustration. Frustration. Smashing, smashing things. Smashing things. Oh, I thought you said smashing things. We get frustrated. Sometimes we are full of fear, depending on what the trial is. Anger. Blank. Anger. Yeah. Sad. Confusion. Sad. Confusion. We, the, the normal response to trial is not to be joyful. And I'll even go far to say this, the normal Christian response to trials is not to be joyful. Not that, I mean, what I'm saying by that is that as Christians, this, this isn't something that just comes naturally to us. This is something that through the Spirit of God transforming our minds that, that we, as we are renewed and made more like Christ, that we are able to see how this is even possible. But what God wants us to do as his people is when we face trials, and it can, as it says, it can be any kind of trial. You know, and, and we faced various trials this year of different kinds. The derecho was a different trial than the coronavirus. Although they're both struggles. Um, financial struggles are different than marital struggles. And marital struggles are different than the struggles that you have with your children and trials that you go through. But the truth is, we probably, all of us, have gone through all of those things at some point in our lives. We have all gone through struggles with health and issues when it comes to things like that. I know for me, and I, I, and I can bet for many of you, you've gone through times of financial struggles where you had to trust God and work hard and just hope and pray that you would make it through. Maybe you've gone through struggles in marriage where it's hard to trust God and know what the right thing to do is. Or maybe your kids have gone through times of rebellion or, or just or just some kind of struggle. It's hard as a parent to see your kids struggle like that. I don't know what your trial is, but I know that you are going through some kind of trial. And God wants us to look at those trials and instead of our natural inclination to run away, to get as far away as possible as we can from trials. Or to be angry and frustrated or sad and full of sorrow. God wants us to look at those trials that we are facing and to count it as joy. Now, count it as joy is really important because it is saying, choose to look at this situation in light of what God is doing. It, it's a choice that we have to make. This is not an emotional response because our emotional response to trial is not joy. If it is, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> our emotional response is not going to be one where we look forward to, to the trials that we face in life. And we seek out the trials we face in life. No, that's not what we do. But what James is saying is our mind needs to be so transformed that we can look at these trials and consider it or count it as something that should bring us joy. Now, I know in my life I have to sometimes say these words out loud. I have to say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but please... Help me see this as something that I can be joyful about. 
because it's not an easy thing to say. It is not something that is easy to do. But we're going to see in this passage that today we will see two ways that we can have joy in trials based on what James tells us. And although it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be something that we want or something that we see, hopefully we can begin to see that when we go through trials, God is working in our lives. That the trials we go through are not meaningless. That they're not just random things that we face. But when we go through trials, God is doing something. And although we might not like the trials we're going through, hopefully we can appreciate and find joy that God is at work in our lives. And trials are one way that God uses in our lives to bring about great growth. We, we see so far that James tells us to count it joy when we meet various trials. Look at verse 3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Do you know that, by the way? Do you know that when you go through tough trials, your faith grows? Yes. yes. Do you know that when you experience difficulties and trials in your life, that your faith increases? James wants everyone who reads this to understand that there is something good that comes from trials. And that when you go through trials, your faith is made strong. Your faith is, is solidified. Now, I know that sometimes we struggle with, with understanding um, certain situations. In fact, in Sunday school, the question came up about, you know, if persecution ever came to America, do you think we would be willing to die for our faith? And, of course, we don't really have an answer to that. But, um, sometimes we don't know that something, we don't know how we're going to react until we're put in certain situations. We don't know what will happen to our faith until our faith is tested. And I remember as a kid, you know, kind of you grow, I grew up in a church. I, I grew up going to Sunday school. I went to um, Moana as a kid, youth group. I, went, I mean, I just grew up in church. And sometimes you have this picture that is not really based in reality about what life is really like, and especially in Christian life. And although I don't think it was taught to me outright, I had this understanding that if you obey God and serve God, good things will happen to you. And then you kind of, you, you meet real life. And you experience things that, that are not what you expect. And as someone, as a young man, I was someone who wanted to serve the Lord. I went to Bible college. I wanted to be in ministry. And you just expect certain things to go a certain way. And all of a sudden, that's not how life is. And that's not how God works. And all of a sudden, you're put in this situation and you have to, your, your faith is put to the test. And I remember going to Bible college as a freshman, wanting to be in ministry. And all of a sudden, some things in my life were, did not go the way I wanted them to. And all of a sudden, I began to have doubts. And I began to say, do I really believe this is real? Do I really believe what I've been taught my whole life? Now, I'm in Bible college. This is a really weird place to begin to question things. But that's where I was. And through that struggle, and it was about a year of a struggle for me, Through that time, I can say that one year of struggle produced such faith in my life 
that from that point on, I can look back in my life and as God brought me through it, as God solidified my faith, as God reassured me that, that he was real and that the Bible was true and that Jesus was, was our Savior and all of those questions that I had in my life, as those things were solidified, my faith became so much stronger. Then after that, some personal things happened. And, and although they were really difficult, because I had just gone through this time where God had increased my faith and, and solidified my faith and, and helped answer all of those doubts, when I went through one of those struggles, my first, my first inclination wasn't to say, oh no, God isn't real. Instead, it was the exact opposite. It was, God brought me through that. He can bring me through this. And then after that, through others' trials, through other, per through other struggles in my life, as difficulties came, I could look back on all of those times that God had brought me through. And it wasn't easy. And it wasn't fun. But my faith was made stronger time after time after time. And that's what God is doing in our lives. He doesn't bring, he doesn't allow trials in our life because he's mean. He wants us to grow. He wants us to be strong. It's good for us. Now, many of you know that when I first moved here, I was much heavier than I am. In fact, I've lost almost, not quite, but almost 100 pounds from the time we moved here. And um, if you've ever lost that kind of weight, it is not easy. It is not fun. Um, I started at a certain point to eat better, exercise. And I started setting goals of, you know, certain, I wanted to lose a certain amount for a certain, and it took me months. And throughout that time, there were lots of times I did not enjoy what I was going through at all. But what I did enjoy was noticing that my belt was loose. <laughs> what I did enjoy was going from a double XL to an XL. And then going from an XL to an L. And I still can't believe it, but I actually have a few things in my wardrobe that are medium. Yeah. That <clears throat> the, str the struggle was not fun, and I wouldn't want anyone to have to go through that. But there was joy throughout it because I saw that something was happening. I saw that I was losing weight. I saw that, that there was some success in what was, what was going on. And I think the same thing can be true of trials. It's not that the experiences that we face are fun or something that we would seek. But through it, we can see God working in our lives. And that is cause for joy. We see the first thing. Oh, actually, we need to read verse 4. Look at verse 4. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The first reason we should have joy in trials is because trials bring maturity. Trials bring maturity. We need trials to grow in our faith. We need them. They are absolutely essential to maturity in Christ. And just so you understand, look at the Bible and look at the trials that people went through and how God used trials in people's lives. We know that, that those who follow Christ, that that's, that's just a part of what it means to, to follow Christ. And you know, for, for the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and, and all of the others, uh, it wasn't as if that their, their whole experience was, was full of ease and comfort. In fact, it wasn't at all. It, while Jesus was on earth, it was not ease and comfort. There were struggles. There were difficulties. They had to learn and grow 
We see someone like Peter even denying Jesus three times. And then after Jesus ascends into heaven, we see this group of, of people um, begin to spread the gospel. And, and they're not, although there's great success, there's also great persecution. And through all that they experienced, God was helping them mature. So that one day, Peter could be one who stands before the whole church and leads this early church through some of the greatest persecutions that they endured. We can, we can see how God worked in someone like John's life. John, you know, we, we look at John and most of us think about his gospel and, and think about the, the epistles he wrote in the book of Revelation. But you remember in the gospels, um, John and James, you know, kind of wanted to be number one. Their mom came to Jesus and said, hey, can my son sit at your right and left? There was a competition, right? Um, they were called the sons of thunder because they wanted, they wanted God to, to judge and cast fire down on a city that rejected Jesus. They, they weren't full of mercy and compassion, right? But look at what happened at the end of John's life. Read, read the, the epistles that John wrote. And I think you can't help but see someone whose life was complete and perspective completely changed. God brought trials to his life. And through it, he grew and matured. And got closer to the Lord. And so for us, as we experience the trials we face, we can look at them and thank the Lord for them and even choose to rejoice in them because God is working in our lives. And one of the things that, that has brought me joy through trials is one of the things Scripture talks about is how faith is tested. And there's a parable of the sower where, you know, the seed is sown on rock on certain ground and it withers away because the trials of life come. But that endurance through trials is a, is, is a, is a proof of authentic faith. And so when, when God brings those in my life and, and I've trusted in him and I've grown through them and I've struggled through those things and, and you come out the other end, that, that to me brings joy that, that yes, this is real. That this faith is real. That this is not something when I was a kid, just that my parents told me, so I believe it because they told me. Through college, I learned I needed to have faith on my own, not based on what my parents said or what my pastor said. It needed to be mine. It needed to be personal. And God taught through that. And, and I became closer to the Lord through that. So one of the reasons we can rejoice or have joy in trials is because trials bring maturity. But it doesn't end there. Let's look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But ask, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now this is a very, very well-known verse. If anyone lacks, lacks wisdom, let him ask God. But sometimes I think we take it out of, out of the context of how it was originally written. It is written with the idea of counting joy in trials. And the thing is, I think many of us struggle with understanding how we can have joy in trials. And James' answer is, ask God for wisdom. If you can't understand what God is doing in your life, if you can't understand how something good can come from the trials that you are experiencing, to understand what he's doing in your life. Ask God for wisdom 
so that you can see the growth that God is bringing about in your life. Ask God for wisdom. Because God will give it generously to all. Without reproach. We have a God who is not wicked and evil and vengeful and spiteful. We have a God who wants us as his children to grow. Now, here's the thing. As children of God, we can't always fully understand everything that he is doing. You know, I think of sometimes when my kids came to me when they were younger and they would ask me the big questions of life, right? We, you have to bring it down to their level. Because they don't understand it all, right? I mean, you, you have to describe things to children in a way that children can understand. And guess what? We're children. And sometimes God has to give his wisdom in ways that we can grasp. You know, we can't understand the mind of God. We can't fully understand the plan of God. But we can have enough wisdom to trust God in what he's doing. And God will give it to us. And he'll give it to us generously. So, I think what we see in, this, in these verses is not only can we find joy in trials because trials bring about maturity, but also, point number two, through trials, I think we find wisdom. I think in trials, we find wisdom when we go to God and trust God through those trials. Because what we, we're faced here with this situation, we're, we're dealing with this trial, we have multiple options of what to do. We can try to handle it ourselves through our own strength, which we do all the time, right? That's, that's usually our, our fallback is we can handle this, right? So we, through our own strength, um, whether it's working hard or just toughing it out, we think we can handle this trial. That usually doesn't work out too well. We break. We break. We break. We break. We're not strong enough to do that. Or we might be able to handle a certain amount, but eventually we're going to find a place where we can't keep doing it. We, we think we can do it on our own. Or maybe sometimes we lean on people around us, which is good. There's nothing, that's a good thing. Family, friends, a community. You know, I think of my neighborhood after the derecho, you probably experienced this too. Everyone got out, was helping each other, working together. I mean, that's great, right? But as Christians, such a way that when we face those trials, our first response is not to try to do it on our own or fix it on our own. It's not to try to look to others to help fix the problem, although those things will probably happen at some point. Our first response needs to be to go to God. So and part of asking God for wisdom is acknowledging that we need wisdom. It's acknowledging that we need Him. That we can't handle these things that we're facing on our own, and we need His help. And when we go to Him with that attitude, with that attitude of submission, acknowledging that He is God and we are not, He will generously give us all the wisdom we need. Now, he talks about faith, you know, and, and that, that's an important thing. God wants us to come to him in faith, to trust that he is able to handle the situations of our lives. 
But sometimes we don't go to the Lord in faith. Have you ever prayed and you didn't believe God was going to answer it? Have you ever been in a situation where you just didn't think God could do anything to get you out of it and help you out? Sometimes we have. Sometimes we struggle. And although I think these verses can, in some ways, as I read them, I kind of, I kind of struggle a bit, but they seem a, a bit harsh because mm. I doubt sometimes. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I, it, it can be, I think, as we look at it, I think, I think this is more than just those doubts that we have from time to time. I think what instead we see is someone who is double-minded, somebody who is not fully committed to giving over to the Lord. And I think this is a struggle we all have to, to ask and trust in faith and rely upon God and His wisdom to help us through whatever we're facing. Now in my life, I, I know that through the trials that I've gone through, they never end overnight. You know, they never just snap and they're over. That would be great. I would, you know, that I would just some of the struggles that I've gone through in my life have been usually like a year or two years, right? <laughs> Or more, right? And so this is one of those verses that reminds us that these things are not just a one-time quick fix. You're done. Trust God. This is a continual process that as God's people, we need to remind ourselves over and over and over again. Through the course of our trials that sometimes last years, we need to remind ourselves that God is at work. We need to make the choice to choose to find joy. Not that we're going through difficulties, but that God is walking beside me and he is increasing my faith. And he's giving me wisdom. And he's helping me and showing me that he is present in my life. And that he is giving me the strength that I need to continue on. Sometimes it's just strength for the day. But it's enough. As we look, as we begin this book in the study of James, and we understand authentic faith, I think what we see here is that authentic faith perseveres the trials and is even able to find joy because God is at work. I just want to encourage all of us. We, we start a new year. 2020 has been tough. I even thought about saying count it all joy when you get through 2020, but I didn't want to change the words of scripture. I didn't say that, but um, 2020 has been tough. As we look to the new year, I have no guarantee that 2021 will be any better. We have no idea what God is going to do. But one thing I would encourage you to do is look back on 2020 and think about the blessings. Mm -hmm. Think about what God has done in your life. Think about the good things and choose to be joyful for those things. Choose to be joyful that maybe instead of the craziness, busyness of life, you spend a lot more time with your family. <laughs> Thank the Lord that through the derecho, we were, our lives were all 
all spare. Choose to find reasons to be joyful instead of looking for reasons to be angry and bitter. And ask God for wisdom when you struggle. Ask Him in faith. You might not be faith, full faith right away, but give it time. I believe the more you ask, the more your faith will increase. And I hope that as we begin this book, we will be challenged, but also encouraged. Because we see that God is working in our lives. That God is doing something in our lives. And although we're not perfect, God is still working on us. And that's a good thing. Let's pray together, Lord. I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this reminder that you are at work in our lives. Not just when things are good, when we're comfortable, but actually you're working sometimes even greater in our lives when things are difficult. And you go through trials. Lord, give us wisdom because we need it. Give us the wisdom to be able to have joy through the trials of our life. Help us to have joy when our faith is made stronger. Help us to have joy when we grow and mature. We can look back and see how much you've done in our lives over the course of a year or five years or ten years. And we can see that you are working in our lives. We thank you, Lord, and we just pray that we will be able to look to you and